My name is Mark Matthews. I'm the executive director of the HC Coombs Policy Forum, which is um, what tomorrow will be our first year of operations. Where, as many of you probably know, we're a strategic collaboration between the Australian government and the ANU. Basically, we're here to sort of enhance the um, interactions in the policy space between um, the ANU and, and the Australian government, and perhaps down the future widely at the state and territory level. And we work in, in partnership, and we do all the things that think tanks normally do, including public lectures, a lot of policy-focused projects, and various other closed-door workshops. Before I say anything else, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're sitting now, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to them. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge Tricia Berman from Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research. Um, Tricia is not only, I've met, I met Tricia, um, who, who's very interested in innovation, in innovation issues, both in public sector and private sector terms, or the late 90s. I remember being with Tricia at the Innovation Summit in 2000. And uh, Tricia being at DISA, we work with the whole of government, but we have a special relationship with DISA, not only um, we, we have a very good and healthy relationship with a number of people in DISA, but they also fund us, so that's a particularly um, <laughs> special relationship. <laughs> and we mustn't ever, ever forget that. Um, so, um, and this is actually something, this event and, a, and another um, event that we're doing shortly, we're actually doing at the request of DISA to help you, I guess, reach, you know, with David, uh, reach a large number of people um, with less, <laughs> little, little hassle for yourselves, I would say. So, look, it gives me great pleasure to introduce David Aubrey. I first came across, it was the first time I met David, well, last night was the first time I met David, David for his work he did with Jeff Mulgham when he was with the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit in the UK, which I found very interesting, um, that, that bringing in that private sector innovation perspective and laying that over what we do, what we uh, do in the public sector, I think was very refreshing. Uh, Jeff Morgan has subsequently, um, I think it was that original report also, but the public sector has a longer history of innovation than the private sector. I remember Jeff did a useful provocation on that, making that point for, for National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts later on. But David has got a very, very um, wide and um, varied and really rich career, um, and you, it's on the fly, so I won't go through it all, but basically he's um, incredibly expert on this whole issue of applying innovation thinking in the public sector, in particular I think the education and welfare domains would be a fair assessment. Um, he's a board director of innovation unit of the Innovation Unit Limited um, company in the UK, Associate of the Institute of Government, Visiting Professor in Innovation Studies at King's College in London, Design and Development Director of the Global Education Leaders Programme, which is called GELP, and, from two, and as I mentioned, from 2002 to 2005, was a principal advisor to the UK Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, which is where he wrote that uh, really quite a landmark paper with Jeff Morgan. So um, it would give me great pleasure to welcome David Aubrey to the ANU. Thank you. I think I've switched the mic on, yeah. Um, okay, very good to, to be here. Um, an honour to be here, really, to give the uh, lecture for the HC Coombs Policy Forum and for the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research, if I've got it all right. Um, what I'm about to talk about, I don't think uh, HC Coombs necessarily would have recognized because it owes more probably for those who are interested in the sort of academic genesis of this to Joseph Schumpeter rather than to J.M. Keynes as in terms of the economics of innovation. But um, what I want to talk about really is the, when this rolls through, um, there we go, is about uh, creating the conditions for radical public service uh, innovation. But I'd like you, at the beginning, before I start to have 10 seconds pause while you get in your heads a public service organization. It could be a school, it could be a hospital, it could be a prison, it could be a government department. It doesn't matter what it is, but what I want you to do, if you will, is just to hold in your heads through the course of the talk that I give a department, a unit, a team, and to think about what is it that would encourage it or people within it to be innovative, to innovate, and to adopt and adapt innovations? Because this rather sterile title, this rather abstract title, at some point has to have purchase on 
schools, hospitals, local authorities, prisons, police forces, whatever it may be. So just hold one in your head, doesn't matter which it is, and ask yourself as we go through, what is it that would induce the school, the university, or whatever it may be, to become more innovative? So, but why, why at all has this, um, why has this subject become so critical over the last few years? Why uh, are there perhaps as many people as there are in this lecture theatre? Why now, as opposed to 10 years ago, are governments across the world talking about public service innovation in the UK, where I spend at least some of my time? Uh, I feel as though there's a sort of embedded macro in some central government computer that if a paragraph of a white paper or a bill is written without innovation in it, this macro comes into operation and inserts the word innovation. It's become a really critical word. And why is that word there? And I'd argue the reason why it's become so important at this time is we are in a sense in the middle of a perfect storm around public services to which radical innovation provides a form of solution. And the important characteristics of that, I'm not going to go through them all in detail, are the sets of different pressures that have come to bear in the, in the beginning of the 21st century on public services in a way that was not, has not been the case at least since perhaps the Second World War uh, and a different situation. I just want to say a little bit about one or two of these just to give us the flavor of how this is impacting. Remember to keep your organization, your institution, or your team in your head at this point. There are, for all these sorts of institutions, a set of long-term challenges. There are changing demographics in every society in the world. In developed societies in the main, this is a phenomenon of aging a phenomenon about an aging population taking over from a younger population in terms of the proportion of the population with concomitant issues around pensions, around retirement, around benefits, around welfare, about lifelong learning and so forth, about obesity, about long-term conditions. There are changes in the ways in which individuals relate to public service professionals. There are differences about what a student in a school can access in terms of information and learning from what there was 20 years ago with or without teachers. There are patients who can access as much, if not more, information about their condition and their disease than any doctor. There is a change induced by changes in private sector and in consumer operations about the way in which people relate to expertise and authority. There are different expectations about access. Why, when I can do my banking 24 hours a day, can't I do my schooling or my healthcare 24 hours a day? And there are a set of persistent issues, different in different countries and different places, which public services and the public sector have tried to tackle, often without success. In the UK, drug and alcohol abuse, despite many interventions, has continued to increase. Obesity, despite many interventions, both childhood and adult obesity, has continued to increase. And then, although, as if those three were not enough, of course, in the last three or four years, for a variety of reasons, in different countries, we have seen a massive fiscal constraint on public services. And therefore, the aim of what we're talking about is not just some incremental improvements and changes in the ways in which we deliver or think about the public sector, but about radical innovation that can produce significantly better outcomes for significantly lower costs. That's the real challenge that we're all facing. How do we equip children with 21st century skills, not just the basics of literacy, numeracy, and maths, but about problem solving, about team collaboration, about critical thinking, and so forth? How do we embrace the fact that health services in Australia, in the UK, and in the Western world were developed to deal with infectious and acute diseases where the vast majority of their expenditure now is on chronic and long-term conditions? where hospitals are antiquated institutions in relation to most of the needs of most of the population. So this sort of radical and compelling innovation, significantly better outcomes for significantly lower costs. This is the challenge. And what I want to spend, therefore, the next 20 minutes on, really, is to 
take you inside a set of findings from research over the last few years that have looked at uh, now some 44, over 40 high-performing innovative organizations and 10 or 12 high-performing and innovative sectors and has tried to distill from that some of the characteristics that uh, define those systems, those sectors, those organizations. So, what are the common characteristics of high-performing innovative organizations, sectors, and systems? And I just want to talk about, about three or four minutes on each of five buckets of factors. Um, I want to talk a bit about culture and leadership, about support and investment, about rewards and incentives, about regulation and openness, and about citizen and user engagement. Because in all these buckets are characteristics of organization systems and sectors. Go back, think about your school and your hospital and all the rest, which determine whether they are or, or influence whether they are and the people within them are innovative and or adopt and adapt innovations. So let's just say something about culture and leadership. So this is interviews with uh, top managers, senior managers, lead professionals in 40 to 45 organizations that are generally recognized as high performing and innovative. Some are private sector, some are public sector, some are third and social sector. And what's, what's so remarkable in these interviews, I don't remember all the time, is these people are passionate. What defines the space of innovation is that the leaders of those organizations are passionate about the outcomes, about the goals, about the ambitions, about the aspirations. They're clear about what those should be, but they're sort of relaxed about the process for getting there. Unlike many organizations that are common in the public sector, which are obsessed with process controls and methods, these people in general are people who have fantastically aspirational goals, are very clear about them, but encourage people to find different ways of meeting them. It is in that space that innovation begins to exist. I'm proud enough at the moment to, uh, or it's, it's a privilege at the moment, to work in New York City with the Department of Education, the Chancellor of the Department of Education in New York City, who have presided over 10 years of the most dramatic improvement in education and performance of any city in the world over the last 10 years, actually has moved to a position of developing a bold innovation strategy because that pace of change was insufficient to get to the place where he wanted to, where 100% of children in New York would graduate from high school within four years with the skills and knowledge necessary for the 21st century. He sets very ambitious goals, but he doesn't define the process and the detail of getting there. That space is where innovation takes place. Secondly, they encourage experimentation and informed and bounded risk-taking. Uh, they tolerate, this is a, I've never got a right phrase for this next bit, which is about tolerating failure, right? Because they know, so they don't tolerate failure in the sense of here's something that isn't working well, let's leave it alone. But they tolerate failure because in the sense that it's only through the process of learning from failure, learning from mistakes, learning from getting our prototypes wrong, that we begin to accumulate the evidence of creating a more powerful innovation. They focus on a limited number of priorities and challenges. These aren't people who talk about an innovative organization as such. They have great clarity. Even the great example that's often used, which is of Google, much famed for giving all its employees 20% of their time to do whatever they want, to be innovative in any way they want. If you then go and talk to the person who, at the time I interviewed him, had this great title of Director of Futures, in Google and say to him, what's, your, what's the strategy for innovation in Google? He will tell you the three things that they're really about. They will encourage others to think about other things, but basically they're focusing most of their resource and most of their effort on a limited number of domains. And these leaders, these senior managers, these lead professionals are hungry, thirsty, exploring all the time the external environment. They are reaching out to other sectors, other organizations, other countries. They're reaching out to the front line of their organizations. These are people who are externally and frontline oriented in their being. 
And finally, and I may come back to this if I have time, they maintain the split screen narrative. They're not just about innovation. They're about how do we continue to improve in our day-to-day -day operations and services and products and so forth at the same time as building the innovative capacity to address present and future challenges. So, culture and leadership, critically important. Let's deal with support and investment and rewards and incentives. The, um, it's definitely the case in these organizations and these sectors and these systems that there is always or nearly always a budget, a fund, a way of distributing money to innovation. That is, they are able to identify these leaders approximately how much of their totality of resource they spend on innovation. And there are people in the audience who probably have much more up-to-date figures than I, but if we look at about five years ago, we look at private sector and companies and private sector and high-performing innovative companies, their spend on innovation would be somewhere often between three and as much as 15 or even 20% of turnover on their innovation effort. I thought we were doing really well in the NHS in the UK, a 100 billion pound organization when we managed to get a fund of 20 million for innovation. But that's a drop in the ocean compared with what we see high performing innovative organizations spending. Money is very important, but as important, if not more important than the money, is the ability to apply methods and support the disciplines and approaches that are necessary to enhance the likely effectiveness of innovation. Uh, these can be incubators, innovation intermediaries, there's a whole raft of organizations that have developed uh, in the public sector over the last 10 years that have brought to bear disciplines from service design, from ethnography, from prototyping, from modeling, from simulation, to bear onto the process of public sector innovation, an area which is still relatively amateur. And I say this because, in a sense, there's a, there's a little bit of history of venture capital that is interesting in this. When, we were, when I was uh, interviewing some venture capitalists, and one sticks in my mind of um, I was saying to a venture capitalist, just tell me the history of it, and told me two stories that were very important. Firstly, they started off believing that the way to operate as a venture capitalist was to find people with good ideas and drop some money on them, wait for them to make a profit, and then uh, get their return on investment. And he said it became rapidly very clear that just because somebody had a good idea did not mean that they had the bunch of skills and expertise to take it into a marketable or serviceable product or service. And that therefore venture capital began to develop the process of wrapping around potential innovators, the skills, expertise, knowledges, people and, uh, and expertises that would enable those people to be more successful in their innovation process. So as well as our funds, we have to think about incubator zones, laboratories, whatever they may be. The design center that the department is putting in place here is a good example that brings to bear some of those disciplined approaches on innovation. And the second story, which relates to the risk portfolio to keep in mind, second story that the venture capitalist told me was in answer to the question, how successful are you? How successful has your investments been over the last few years? He said, in the last 10 years, over 60% of our investments have been successful. And I said, that's very impressive. And he said, no, it's terrible. And the reason he said it was terrible, he said, it's too high. Because if you want really powerful innovation or really powerful investment, you have to be able to take a chance on some pretty wild cards in this process. And his view was that the success ratio of their investments was in a sense a marker that they weren't taking big enough risks. And that balance of risk and reward of that portfolio of innovations is also a very important part of public sector innovation. What I said about culture and leadership, think head teacher of school, think commander of police station, think chief executive of agency, is all very important. What I've said about Support and investment is all very important in encouraging people to be innovative. 
But I also want to talk about, as it were, adoption adaptation. What encourages individuals, teams, and organizations not to be innovative of themselves, but to uh, adopt and adapt other people's innovations? Because most innovations spread through a process of adaptation and adoption. I'll come back to our message. So what we find in organizations that are successful, high-performing, and innovative is that there are rewards and incentives in these organizations and systems and sectors, not just for being an innovator, but for adopting and adapting innovation. We have lots of prizes and awards for innovators in the public sector. It's great. It's encouraged more innovation. It's very good. But what it does is to continue to celebrate the person who's the originator of the innovator, innovation, rather than those organizations and teams that would adopt and adapt those innovations. We know there are mechanisms that we could do this at the individual level and at the team level and at the organizational level. It still amazes me that in general, hospitals, schools, police forces, local governments, there is no real incentive other than public good and public mindedness, which is a really important feature, for improved results. Most funding systems in most parts of the world are neutral or perverse with regards to institutions really improving their performance. And doing that is a really critical part of uh, creating conditions for radical innovation. Um, these are not just financial, these are also reputational rewards that are, that are in place. And um, finally, I will put in this bracket that we know that one of the things that drives innovation in different sectors and different systems and different organizations is granular comparative performance information. And by granular, I don't mean at the level of the hospital or the school. That actually we know that although we're rather fond of them in government of sort of star ratings or judgments, about, comparative judgments about hospitals or schools or police forces or whatever, Actually, what matters to the public and to the users and professionals in those organizations is much more what's happening in the particular specialty with the particular consultant or in the particular clinic or in the particular subject in the school. Because that does two things, one of which I will say a word or two more about later on, about the way in which the public and users respond to that, but it also harnesses peer and professional challenge and pressure. That is, innovation occurs or gets spread in part because I realize that the doctor down the road is achieving better clinical outcomes than I am through the operations that I'm doing. So comparative performance information at the level of the subject or the specialty or the service or the unit is a critical part of this. Okay. The advantage of this, were we to be able to get it right, especially if we had some financial reward for improvement in performance, is that rather than the mechanism we have at the moment for most public services, which is a, a form of funding that is, in a sense, a sort of grant funding, you would begin to build a cycle of return on investment. You would be able to invest in innovation, which were it to be able to uh, improve performance, and if there is a premium attached to that improvement in performance, that can be recycled back into the fund. And we see some governments and some organizations beginning to experiment in those sorts of domains in, in, in public services. Okay. This is slightly more complex. And this one I have to remember what Olivia told me at the beginning about how far I can walk. Right? Okay. So I want to say something about the structure of these sectors. If you look at high performing innovative sectors and systems, they have very think sectors actually for now. You're going to have to have two things in your head. You've got your school or whatever it was in that. And now I want you to think about a sector. Think for the moment just about um, software or media. Right? And in these sectors which are high performing and innovative, they have peculiarly, they have very similar structures. That is, they have a core of a small number of large dominant players. People who are occupying an oligopolistic core, often four or five major players. And round the edge, a wide periphery of specialist suppliers, niche providers, 
startups and so on. So if you've, got, if you've got this in your head in your sector, you've got a few firms or companies or organizations who are providing most of it, but are in competition with one another in an oligopolistic sense. And you have a wide periphery of startups coming in, of people who are specialist providers, niche suppliers, whatever it may be. No? And there is fluidity across both boundaries. There are people exiting and entering that periphery all the time. And there is significant merger and acquisition activity and demerger activity going on between the core, or the godpolistic core, and this periphery of smaller organizations. This is why I need to walk. So if you start in the beginning of the 20th century, in um, the sector that you've chosen. It doesn't actually matter which one it is. I'm going to hold in my head motor manufacturing. In Britain, in 1900, you have something in excess of 200 motor manufacturers, all of roughly similar size. And as you march through the 20th century, the structure of motor manufacturing moves more and more towards this oligo oligopolistic core and wide periphery. Yeah? Get aggregation into the center and dispersal around the edge. You do this for motor manufacturing. You do this for pharmaceuticals. You do this for media. You do this for software. You do this for newspapers. Do this for whatever of those sectors you like. There are very technical economic indicators in economics for measuring these levels of aggregation and the disaggregation around the edge. And if you then look at health or education, and as you march through the 20th century, actually the basic sectoral structure, despite lots of peripheral administrative restructurings, the basic structure of operation stays remarkably the same. And why is this important in terms of innovation, or more importantly, why is this important in terms of the diffusion of innovation? Is because the problem that we have in the public sector about this disaggregation means that the mechanism that is taking place in other sectors, which is the reason why innovation diffuses much faster, isn't there. That is, we have to be careful in these things which are now filmed. Um, if you think of the, a large, one of the largest software manufacturers, <laughs> they of themselves are not particularly innovative. But what they are is fantastically acquisitive. So that were you to dream up in your garage, a really powerful piece of software. Whereas if you are in your doctor's surgery, as it were, it will take you forever to talk to your colleagues and so forth. I'll say more about that in a moment to get it there. These nice people from this imaginary giant software company come along and say to you, we can make you a very rich person if you will give us your property. And they take it away from you and push it across 100 million platforms overnight. The process of acquisition is the process of scaling. The process in which they encode those into wider domains of operation is important. The ability to expand market share for startups to grow into these spaces is very great. In, I do a lot of work, as Mark mentioned, in education. And I used to ask people in departments of education as it's going around, if there was a really, if somebody found a really powerful way in one school of taking people age five and getting them to a sort of graduate maths level by age 10, how long would it take to spread through your entire education system? To which the answers generally vary between a decade or more and never. Right? Right? And partly that's because what we have, even in those quote marketized systems of public services, is massively high levels of disaggregation, which are effectively competing small units which have no ability to scale. So this process is very important in terms of 
the way in which um, public services operate. And therefore, the financial market and economic regulation of public services, which is about a million miles away from where most people start off thinking about innovation, is absolutely key to whether innovation happens and whether it spreads. Think about your school in terms of what it really cares about. It cares about getting its funding, it cares about its examination, and it cares about its inspection report. These are the big drivers, not the fund over here which is about innovation, not somebody just standing up and saying it's a good thing. So unless we're attentive to those wider conditions and determinants of innovation, we won't really foster uh, high levels of uh, public sector innovation and its diffusion. Last bucket. Olivia, how am I doing on time? I got, I'm okay, good, cool. Okay. Um, the other thing that's interesting about these high-performing innovative organizations is their relationship to their publics, to their users, to their markets, to their citizens. Um, I think in general in public services over the last decade, we have got much, much better at believing it is important to engage with our users. Though with some prominent exceptions, some of which we can find in uh, Australia, Whereas others, we are still, in my view, a long way behind some of the best practice in the private and the third sector behind what innovative organizations really do in this. Um, uh, these organizations, the Apples, the Googles, uh, other high-performing innovative organizations definitely don't send out surveys and ask for people to return them. Um, they definitely don't uh, um, get a group of um, people who are relatively satisfied with the service and won't cause too much trouble coming in and talking to them. Um, they generally don't go for uh, offering people blank sheets of paper and saying, how would you like Google to be? Uh, and they generally don't offer detailed plans that ask people to comment on sort of clause 1.7.3 about this particular point. And there's still too much of that in public sector that goes on by way of sort of what's called user engagement. What these organizations do do is they move more and more to both co-create and to co-produce with their users. Indeed, the notion of users or customers begins to dissolve as far as possible in this. They see the ways of interaction between professionals, designers, and users, and the public as absolutely central and key to both the design process and the delivery of the services or the products and so forth. Secondly, they don't go for the usual suspects. Um, some people have heard me on this before, but Apple don't like me as a user because uh, I just tell them I love my iPhone and it's great and if only it was a bit thinner and lighter, it'd be even more wonderful. They like people who are really dissatisfied, who say it's a complete rubbish as a product because it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, and I want to use it in this way, it doesn't do it in that sort of way and so forth. These organizations reach out to their most extreme, most leading edge, most difficult, most obstructive users, because in those places, cite the gems of how one can build things for the future. If you've got a school in your head, think, if a school could tackle somebody with major learning impediments, maybe learning difficulties, disadvantaged families, etc., the chances are we'd get it right for everyone. If we can deal in our health service with the person who has multiple conditions and is homeless, we can probably get it right for everyone else. Right? So reaching out to the extreme and the most difficult, the most disadvantaged and the most complex is a way of engendering uh, uh, radical innovation. Um, and I'm going to end, in fact, by talking about just uh, one other part of that and then just say one, one conclusion of this. Um, um, I've tried to identify along the way here two problems. One is relatively easy to solve and we've got a lot better at it, which is about increasing the flow of innovation. 
increasing the innovation pipeline. Um, most of the policies for innovation that have been developed by governments across the world over the last 10 years have been supply side policies about innovation. There have been ways of increasing the volume of innovation that takes place in public services. But actually, as I alluded to earlier on, the problem is not one of the volume of new innovations, a bit of an oxymoron, uh, volume of innovations per se. The problem in public service and public sector is a problem in the main about diffusion, is about the way in which innovations tend to, sp tend to spread or not spread, tend to stay locked on the location of origin. That's an innovation in one part of a government department often doesn't spread to another, never mind to adjacent government departments, never mind to adjacent states or territories, never mind to other countries. But what happens in one doctor's surgery often stays locked there. You can go back five years later and it, won't, it will still be in that one surgery, not spread to other things. This is a problem, the problem of diffusion of innovation. And therefore, continuing to look at supply side issues, and continuing to believe that this is just uh, sorted out by information is, I would argue, missing the point. That as well as the issues that we've talked about, about the regulation and sectoral shape, my stuff about oligopoly and, per and periphery, actually we need to be thinking about how do we mobilize and encourage the demand side to pull innovation through. And I'll end by two stories, one of which I uh, told, so forgive me for those who were with me last night, I told last night, uh, uh, and one other. Um, uh, a few years ago I was uh, privileged enough to hear the head of research for a global pharmaceutical company talk about the fu future of pharma pharmacological research, but he started off with a slide that was about uh, 10 high impact drugs and how long it took from clinical approval of those drugs to then going into widespread practice. Yeah. So evidence is there, clinical approval, how long to widespread practice. And it varied from, these are all drugs that have major impact on large numbers of the population. It took from several months to several years, the difference between them. So I asked, well, what is it that makes a difference? He said, we haven't done any really systematic research, but I point out one very strong correlation. And that's a correlation between the shortness of the time to diffuse, to move from clinical approval to widespread practice, and the strength of patient organizations in those areas. Not the strength of clinical networks, not the strength of the number of academic professional conferences, but the strength of patient organizations. So one of the fastest diffusion rates of drugs was antiretroviral drugs for people living with HIV and AIDS. Not because the evidence was more over overwhelming, it was in all the other cases overwhelming, not because doctors heard more about it or received more information, but because the network and community of people living with HIV and AIDS is strongly networked and empowered and moves information and demand amongst itself. It creates, it goes to the doctor, the clinic, and says, I have heard, it might be in London or Paddington or wherever it may be, and says, I have heard that this treatment was given to my friend, my colleague, the person I know over there. They become the demanders of this system. Second example. There's a lot, I think you call it, forgive me if I get this wrong, I think you call them self-directed services in Australia, and I think in the UK we talk about personal, personal or individual budgets. This is about giving people with, often with uh, a number of disabilities or multiple conditions, the ability to control how, how that resource is deployed, whether which bits of public services they might want to assemble. This innovation, whilst it was thought about by and um, developed in some settings by some professionals, actually has taken off across the world, not because of 
as it were, government or public sector broadcast methods, dissemination of this, but by very active working of groups of people living with disabilities and multiple conditions, arguing for, advocating for, and mobilizing that control themselves. So my last and looping point on this is to say that if we can find ways of involving users in the co-creation and co-delivery of public services, not only will the innovations be enriched in that process and more radical, but they become, if we can find ways of strengthening and empowering uh, those organizations, then they become the advocates and the mobilizers of demand. My concluding sentence, therefore, is to leave you with two things. One is to say, if we're thinking about really improving, increasing innovation and its diffusion in public services, what we need to do, strangely, is not just more R&D, but strengthen and empower organizations. And two, if as government agencies, we want to foster innovation and stimulate diffusion, we don't need to just look at, as it were, those things that look like direct levers, but those conditions, be they funding regimes, regulatory regimes, and accountability regimes, that will impact across them. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, David. You've given us so much to think about. And, uh, People are still here despite it being lunch, so <laughs> having the right impact. Uh, we have time for questions, so I'd like to uh, invite people to um, ask questions of David. I think we also have a roving mic, that's correct. So, questions up here in the middle? You talked about getting the people with a, um, a disagreement involved people who might not necessarily agree with where you're going. Um, for a lot of public service organisations, that's a very political thing to do. How do you negotiate that challenge? Um, well, it goes back to my point about the, uh, um, I think what I talked about earlier on was informed and bounded risk taking. Right? Um, as I was sharing with Trisha earlier, there's, there's various, um, sayings that have become popular in uh, governments and public, public sectors across the world, one of which is we want everyone to be an innovator. I don't. Um, we want every organization to be innovative. I don't. Um, why don't I want that? Because actually there's lots of things that need to routinely carry on day to day and just to be sort of routinely, consistently improved. So we need to find spaces in which zones and incubators and labs, these are all different terms to be used around the world, in which we assemble the conditions under which radical innovation for significantly improved outcomes for significantly lower costs are achieved. So my sell to ministers and politicians is on the basis not of innovation per se, which despite everything I've said I think is deeply uninteresting, but on the ability to radically improve people's lives, which I think is powerfully interesting, and most ministers agree with. If you can create that bounded space, then I think it's possible to bring together people. I'm not talking about politicians so much and those disagreements. I'm talking about people with different perspectives. And I just want to give one very quick example of this. Sorry, education is top of my head at the moment. In schools, right? I was working with a group of schools in the UK. Hmm might need a translation from somebody. Um, and we were trying to think about different, different models of sort of arranging schooling. And we brought in someone from EasyJet, budget airline. What's your equivalent here? Jet, is Jetstar a budget airline? Sorry? Jetstar will do it, okay. Um, not because, and as I said this many times, not because I want EasyJet to run schools. In fact, I hate the idea of EasyJet running schools. But bringing in the perspective from other areas is really important in terms of freeing ourselves up. And so EasyJet, and so the head teachers were very skeptical, but this guy from EasyJet said, 
is 29. So I don't understand why you'd start your classes all at the same time. Said, so, you know, we'd never try and get all our planes up in the air at the same time. So the head teachers go, well, you know, you've got teachers and rooms and things like that. No, they go, we've got planes and ports and so on. And the point of it was to start to free up people's ability to see these things differently. So there's a great advert, I think, by Xerox a couple of years ago in the States when they were trying to design new interfaces for their computers, uh, for their um, uh, machines. And they said, their advert said, wanted artists, dramatists, poets, playwrights, um, historians, sociologists, etc. And then in little words at the bottom it says, and maybe the odd systems analyst. Yeah? Right? Because they know that where radical innovation comes from is those sort of really contrasting and different perspectives from users, from different professions, from other sectors, and so forth. But in a bounded space, it's not about doing that across the place. Sorry. Well, so I'll speed up. Sorry, I just wanted to respond to your um, notion of uh, user groups driving demand. Um, and it just seems to me that not all user groups are the same. I thought that the example you gave about retrovirals was particularly interesting. Um, I mean, you know, some user groups, you, you're dealing with a group of users who are very disadvantaged, who have very little capacity maybe to advocate on their own behalf, that may need a lot of assistance with that, that may not have many financial resources, or you might be need, dealing with a community, as you were with retrovirals, for example, that's um, got a history of political advocacy, that's concentrated in one geographical area, that has a lot of professional and uh, financial resources to draw on. Those, so if, if that's a really important factor, it seems to me you have to deal with the fact that not all user groups have the same capacity to drive demand. Uh, I 100% agree. And some of those groups that you've identified have been the most powerful in co-creating new solutions. So I think of, particularly in the area of mental health, with people with very severe uh, learning difficulties who have uh, really helped reframe what mental, service, mental health services look like and so forth. Um, I think of some work both in the States and in Northern Europe with uh, homeless networks and so forth. But the important bit is I think to say, that the bit to say here is our job, if we are serious about innovation, is finding ways of strengthening and empowering those organizations and not, as you say, assuming that they are all got sufficient resource and so forth. But it was an attempt to sort of move our focus of innovation policy away from a sort of supply side area to a sort of a slightly more unusual and difficult domain about working with these groups and networks and organizations in such a way. But you're completely right. They are very different. But they all have, they are all an asset is the important part of this, which we fail to mobilize often in our efforts around this. Hi. I think can you hear me? Yeah, I found that really interesting because I, I keep reflecting on where we're at and you hear the terminology. It's the same here as in the UK. Citizen-centric services, joined up government services, linking and collaborating with community organisations, which is where the innovation is in service delivery. Where are we fa falling short? Why aren't we able to really make that shift using these notions, which are very similar to what you're talking about? Where are we falling short? Well... Uh, the two areas that I think we're still grappling with is the bit that's around this really hard question about the sort of structural shape and sort of sexual regulation issues and how those hinder and enable innovation. And that sounds like a very arcane and technical issue, and I used to think it was. But as I talk with public service organizations sort of here and in the UK and around the world. Actually, what makes the difference to the teacher, the clinician, and so forth, sits in that domain in a very powerful and important way. So we've got pockets of innovation, but we haven't been able to really spread that, I think, because of that. And the second is, um, it's pretty amateurish still. I mean, we've got better, but it is pretty amateurish. If I go off to organizations in, um, sort of well-known innovative organizations, some in the few in the public sector, but mainly in the private and third sector, they have really thought about how do you, what are the processes 
how do you do prototyping in a really effective way, not pilots, which is what we do in public sector? How do you use modeling? How do you use simulation? How do you use ethnographic research? How do you use this? So there's something about the application of, the word, I don't think I've used it today, but the word I use a lot it, it, when I'm talking in more detail about supporting innovation at a sort of local organizational level, it's about discipline. We've said too, not too much, we've said a lot about creativity and ingenuity and imagination over the last few years. We've learned, no, let's liberate people's creativity. I'm all for that. But we know that innovation also comes out of a process of applying the discipline on top of that creative energy. I think we've got a long way to go in doing that. Though we are getting, we are getting better. Um, I almost wanted to ask the reverse of that because uh, in the spirit of comparative performance information, I often get really excited about the things I find going on around in Australia. And often get people say, oh yeah, but you know, England's so much farther ahead and America's so much farther ahead. And I think we need to, to really um, push some of the really bright spots that we've got around our own public service. Uh, have you been able to get a hint about what they are? From your perspective? Well, it's invidious. Um, uh, no, I, I, just, I just want to caution the push bit. Right? I just want to caution the push bit here because uh, I guess this goes back to my point about we've, we've been very supply side thinking in our actions around innovation and not sufficiently demand side. And if you track what we've done about trying to diffuse those fantastic pockets or even examples of innovation more broadly. We've used websites and pamphlets and exhibitions and seminars and workshops and lectures and so on. We know the research is quite clear that these are of limited effectiveness. Right? People have become very fond of innovation exhibitions, innovation expos. You can get very high levels of satisfaction from people attending those. But all the evidence is on follow-up surveys that nobody does anything with it. They go along and they look around and they go, oh, that's all fantastic. Oh, that's really, oh, blimey, no, that's, oh, I'd really like to do that in my place. And then you go back and ask them three, a week later, three weeks later, a month later, what's happened? And they've forgotten about it. They've heard this inspiring thing about this great center in Perth or this fantastic um, new educational development in Victoria or wherever it may be, but it sort of sits there because it's, too, it's, it's not just about information, it's about a change in mindset and ways of thinking. It's a change in working practices and a change in power relationships that's really at stake. And therefore we have to think about how do we, ins how do we create the spaces in which those innovations occur and how do we create the pools and the incentives, not just the pushes of information. So I am for celebrating, don't get me wrong, because I think there's some fantastic things in the public sector is as innovative as the private or third sector. It just doesn't diffuse is one of the major problems there. So it's really cool. yeah. I have a, two sort of linked questions, um, but first I guess uh, the background is important. So I um, was on, sorry, I was on um, the steering committee for a uh, decade-long study of radical innovation in private industry. Um, the second phase of which was uh, how, do you, how do companies uh, establish a sustained competency in doing radical innovation? The, the prime finding out of that uh, second phase was the enormous difficulties of organisations of simultaneously having a culture which um, fosters operational excellence, doing the current stuff really, really well, and um, the uh, ability to explore and do the radical innovation, what you call the screen. So, um, so I guess the first question is, is how can uh, an organ organisations do these things simultaneously? Um, and the, the, the link question um, is that you, a couple of times you, you seem to have said, uh, well, you set up a, this bounded separate space, a lab, a, 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 something which is bounded and a bit separate where you can do these experiments. Um, a number of um, companies in the study so both in the companies in the study, some did separation, some didn't. 
And the ones which did this, refused to separate, um, they refused to, and IBM is probably the leading example of this, um, they refused to separate because of the difficulties of transferring the learnings, reintegrating back into the, to the mainstream organisation, which seems to go to the heart of one of your main points about how do you actually get the, the diffusion out. So, you know, if your answer to the cultural issue is something separate, then how do you handle the, uh, the diffusion uh, issue? And I wish I had easy answers to either of those questions, both of which are really important and both of which, in my experience, are the questions that are bugging uh, leading professionals and senior managers across public services. The bit, uh, you said it much more uh, elegantly than I'm about to, but which was my point about maintaining the split screen initiative. Let me, let me go back to my New York City example, just because it's fresh in my head, right? They, they've got a process that has increased significantly improvements in schools over the last 10 years, but they don't feel it's good enough and isn't going to address future challenges. So they were trying to think about how do we do that in a, how do we keep the pressure on for most of the schools to continue doing that whilst building some capacity for the future. So that's where they got to this notion about we'll have a innovation zone, sort of we'll bound this area off and we'll do the interesting and innovative things over there. Um, but it's a really hard narrative to maintain because the schools that are in, if you like, just sitting there doing the standard improvement things are saying, well, why are they allowed to innovate and we aren't? Or there's all sorts of problems about the overall narrative you tell them that. So I, I absolutely echo that. And the problem is, if you try to do it in the mainstream, all the lessons are it tends to get absorbed. The radical innovation is really hard. So the work of Clayton Christensen, for those who like following this up, I think is very illuminating here in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, where he, say, he looks at carefully how large organizations and large systems, for all sorts of reasons, not least they are vested and invested in the status quo, even if they meet really radical innovations, tend to as it were, reduce them to something more conventional because it's such a threat to their sort of identity and being and behaviors and practices. Right? So there's a problem about trying to do it in the mainstream and there's a problem exactly the one that you said of trying to do it on the margin. Um, not least because um, the problem of reintegration back into the mainstream. Right? Um, I think some of these become regulatory issues. The one phrase I hear more and more, and that the Chancellor in New York articulated, which I thought was good, was to talk about and to think about ways in which you talk about that zone or that area being championed and authorized by the main organization and working on behalf of, and finding the ways in which you link, therefore, the innovative activity that's going on there back into the mainstream, not as an end product, but as a process issue all the way through, is pretty important. But I absolutely think it's where I hear governments uh, throughout the world, public service organizations throughout the world, absolutely trying to address this conundrum. So I think it's a really, really, really real issue. But we'll hear from two more. Oh, I do apologise to others, but I'll stick with Thank you. For, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'd like to go back to your um, comments around the uh, growing excess of um, push, push type um, in. Uh, activities that, that, that are celebrating innovation as a way of trying to grow the idea of increasing innovation. Um, I'm interested in the, in the development of poor kinds of activities and how that might be introduced into the education system and into schools. Um, I, I mean, you know, any parent knows that show and tell at school is really important to the children, but isn't that really teaching them how to, how to become celebrities and engage in this whole kind of push showcasing um, activities and um, are there any initiatives and, and things happening where children are being stimulated to think about an ideal kind of school environment? Parents are being asked to think about that 
for instance, and then making choices and then examining the consequences of their choices. In that, and so they've start to learn how to become um, how to become creative and innovative in a structured way. And I, th I think that's right. And I think that that's about um, um, it's about the other side of it. Show and tell may have its effects, but actually we know that profound and deep learning occurs through collaborative problem-based or project-based inquiry and that therefore what one's looking at in these innovation processes seems to me is creating the right sorts of collaborations that are centered on that. So I think there are examples, I'm sure there are examples in Australia and I can't bring them to mind, uh, but you know, in New York and in other places there are examples of absolutely of parents, of students, of teachers, uh, of social entrepreneurs together figuring out what education will be like in the 21st century and engaging their wider audiences in that process themselves. So that it's the, in the, um, several analysts are starting to use this extremely inelegant new word of innofusion to talk about the way instead of innovation and then diffusion of the ways in which you construct communities into the innovation process itself such that in a sense they are self-generating the demand. So that having your user organizations, not just because we want a couple of users here to make it look better, but having the users there because they are genuinely trying to create those networks uh, is a really important part of that. And I think there are things going on. Actually in health, in welfare, in adult, care, adult social care, in elderly, I think there are examples throughout the world of this beginning to take off in a rather profound way, aided and abetted by sort of web technologies, for at least for some of these groups. Just the last question up here from the Hello. Um, so your perfect storm, um, it may create the, um, it may make um, innovation more desirable, but it doesn't necessarily facilitate the ability to then innovate, um, because um, you kind of need to be able to take a step back and in order to come w up with new ideas. And there really isn't the, um, like the time or resources to kind of do that when you're just really getting by and trying to meet day-to-day -day demands. Um, do you have any comments on that sort yeah. of conflict? I suppose I want to label this the drivers and the rest of what I was talking about as sort of the conditions or enablers of that innovation process. My experience is slightly at variance with what you've said. What always astounds me in all the areas of innovation that I've worked in in different countries is the discretionary effort that professionals and managers and leaders will put in when the goal is an ambitious set of outcomes or aspirations. That once you liberate people to operate in that space, the discretionary effort they will give is immense. And given that I've said I'm not interested, I don't want everyone to be an innovator, I only need a few to start that process. So I do think there's something about discretionary effort. If I repeat, we're not, I'm not interested, we're not interested in innovation for its own sake, therefore you should spend 10% of your time, but to really achieve significantly better outcomes for significantly lower costs, I think does really motivate people and that discretionary effort is therefore given. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank you. David. And, um, I, I certainly am excited with uh, what we've heard today. I think that um, the important messages that David has brought to our attention is that innovation is a mechanism to achieve outcomes. And we as uh, a bureaucracy, I'm representing um, the Australian public sector in a way, and I know many of you are there, we want to achieve really good outcomes. And innovation is a mechanism whereby we can achieve some of that. But it's about the outcomes ultimately, and uh, we mustn't forget that. It's not innovation for its own purpose. And sometimes you need to educate those around you about that message. Look, uh, David, with his 40-odd years' experience in this area, brings the inside-outside perspective. He is not a public servant. Uh, he has been an academic. He's worked in the public sector but as a consultant. And I think that's also a reason that he can see things with various um, lenses on. And that's a, a task we have ahead of us as 
we would have to think of things from the citizens' perspective as well as the government's perspective and or the So we have a, a real challenge. But I hope this was a, a, an uplifting experience for you, and uh, certainly was for us, and uh, we're very, very pleased that uh, you were able to join us today. David, and also I'd like to thank um, the Coombs um, Policy Forum because uh, they helped bring this together and this is another inside-outside experience that we're having. So uh, thank you very much, David, on behalf of everybody. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.